Good afternoon, um, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this SIPFA webinar, where we'll be considering uh, some of the factors um, around the spending review and its likely impact. Um, I'm Vivian Russell. I'm Head of Communications and Content at SIPFA, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. Uh, any of our regular listeners will know we've uh, been running a series of webinars over the past few months where we are unpacking some of the issues for public finance professionals that are emanating from the current pandemic. So these might be professional technical issues or personal and psychological ones or, or matters of, of policy like what we're talking about today. So the spending review, uh, it feels like we've been waiting a very long time for this. Uh, we, know, we know it's going to take place on the 25th of November, just over two weeks time. Uh, and we also know it's going to be a single year settlement, uh, not a multi-year settlement. Uh, it will set departmental capital and resource budgets for 2021-22. Um, and the government has said that this one year approach will allow it to continue to prioritise its response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Chancellor Rishi Sunak has indicated there will be enhanced support for public services and has stressed that he understands the need for certainty. So while we wait for further detail on the review itself, over the next hour, we're going to be unpacking some issues for the public sector, both local government, uh, particularly social care um, and the NHS. And our expert speakers will be sharing their insights. Before I introduce today's speakers, I just want to remind everyone that we do want this to be an interactive event and that this is an opportunity for you to put your questions and comments forward to allow our speakers to respond and discuss. You can um, submit a question via the question panel um, on the GoToWebinar dashboard that you should be able to see on your screens. And once the presentations have concluded, I'll put those forward to our speakers. Hopefully we'll have 10, 15 minutes at the end um, for discussion, maybe more. We'll see how we go. Uh, you can submit a question at any time. Uh, there's no need to wait for the end of the presentation. So do send those in as they occur to you. So to discuss the spending review today, um, I'm delighted to introduce three great speakers um, who can address the issue from, from quite distinct but related perspectives. Um, we have Andrew Burns, who's Associate Director uh, for Local Government here at SIPFA. James Bullion, President of ADAS and Director of Adult Social Services at Norfolk County Council, and Anita Charlesworth, Director of Research and the Real Centre at the Health Foundation. So our first speaker is Andy Burns. Um, before joining SIPFA, Andy was Director of Finance and Resources at Staffordshire County Council, as well as Treasurer of the Staffordshire Pension Fund. Andy is also a trustee of the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny. Um, he has an MBA from Aston Business School and is a former president of the Society of County Treasurers. So, Andy, over to you. Thank you, Viv. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Really pleased to be here this afternoon. And I'm going to talk about uh, the submission that SIPFA made into the spending review at the end of September when we thought and indeed the treasury intended that that was to be a multi-year probably a three-year process uh, for the three years following the next year starting in april 21. of course as viv mentioned we now know it's to be just a one-year spending review on the 25th of november and for all public services uh, uh, and for local government in particular that will mean a one-year settlement that we will hopefully hear about sometime just before christmas I think forecasting revenue uh, and spending in a dynamic economy such as the UK's is uh, challenging at the best of times. And given the uncertainty created by the convergence of COVID and Brexit, building on previous austerity, demographic challenges, etc., we understand why the government has opted for a one year spending round. However, whilst we understand the influence of those uh, factors, particularly COVID and Brexit, it's important to we don't lose sight of the fundamental principle that multi-year settlements are a more effective way of managing public money. And steadying the ship in turbulent waters also requires taking a longer term view. Emergency measures will eventually be needed and need to be accounted for. And whilst tough decisions can be postponed in the short term, to ignore them would be to the government and society's peril over the medium term. So moving on to 
my next slide. Uh, I'm trying to press it, it's not moving forward. I'll try again. Uh, can somebody help me? I'll, I'll, move, I'll, I'll do it for yeah. you. Okay, okay. thanks, okay. Chairman. I'll indicate when, when the next one comes. So, uh, the headlines in SIPA's submission, uh, when we thought it would be a longer term view, I think they still stand. Uh, and particularly because there's likely now to be one in 2021, even if it's not now. And I think the three key headlines from SIPA's submission uh, was that the long term stability of public services needs multi year financial settlements that include investment in prevention and are focused on place based outcomes. And SIPA believes that place based funding allows for spending decisions to reflect local circumstances, local need, local priority local assets, uh, maximising integration and the alignment of public services while improving outcomes and delivering value for money. Uh, and importantly, the spending review must demonstrate a greater progression towards transformational change if our public services are to survive. Many delegates will have heard the phrase, we can't afford the future unless we change what we do. I think never has that been, been more important. The public finances are currently not sustainable. Uh, so so they, were the, they were the key headlines. Uh, moving on to the next slide then, please, Viv. Uh, the, de the details of SIPA's submission, there were seven key areas. There was an exec summary, as you might expect, and an economic assessment undertaken by SIPA's new chief economist, Jeffrey Matsu. Uh, and I'll signpost those, uh, and you know, they are on SIPA's website in the full submission. But I'm going to talk about the five headings that I've put in bold bullet points there. Something about local government, something about health and social care, to hopefully set up James and Anita to follow to talk in more detail about those issues. Touch on a few issues about uh, NHS capital. Share SIPFA's thinking about a proposed five point plan for guiding social care reform. And then finish with some remarks about the importance of public health prevention and place. So turning to the first of these then in terms of, in terms of local government. SIPFA have long argued for effective longer term financial planning and multi-year settlements uh, are at the heart of good financial management. And indeed, they were encapsulated in SIPFA's Financial Management Code of Good Practice that was published in September uh, last year. The long-standing funding gap as a consequence of 10 years of austerity uh, is rising. You now, demographic challenges exacerbated by COVID. A range of different ways of measuring that funding gap if you look at the spending in real terms at the end of the decade, they were the start, it's between 25 and 30% less in real terms. Uh, uh, the, LGA, the LGA have identified looking ahead during the spending review period, there's a seven billion pounds financial gap for local authorities of which five billion relates to social care. So uh, no, uh, that, that funding gap isn't, uh, isn't going away. Financial resilience of councils is challenged and coming under existing pressure. And there have been some short term additional increases in resources for local government, uh, mainly on not just for social care, but they have been short term, like sticking plaster type uh, interventions, the adult social care precept or specific social care grants, the better care fund with our health partners, uh, increasing number of councils having access to the business rates pilot scheme or new homes bonus, and a slightly better settlement in the final year of the last spending, spending round. Uh, but they were all, as I say, sticking plasters, not proper solutions. The government's intended medium term solutions were a fair funding review, uh, further business rates localization, and funding for social care reform on back of the long delayed white paper. They are all delayed, deferred, some might say dead. Uh, SIPFA argues that a greater focus needs to be placed on prevention and focused on outcomes and investment criteria needs to reflect those. Whether those outcomes are improved health and well-being for local populations, or improved economic prosperity shared by all, or safer or stronger communities, they cannot be delivered by local government working alone. That needs to be undertaken working jointly in collaboration with key partners, with businesses and citizens. We need multi-agency, cross-organisation, cross-year approaches to have any chance at all of being sustainable in the medium term. Uh, SIPFA recommends place-based approaches about aligning public services around health and care, about police and mental health services, 
about economic prosperity uh, and also uh, commends local place-based approaches to effective asset management through things like the One Public Estate and a preventative approach that also focuses on reducing demand, avoiding future costs to improve outcomes across place and time. Finally, a few words about council tax and business rates. You know, councils are struggling at the moment with lower than usual collection in both those two tax bases. The government have promised some short-term support to defer the shortfalls, but there is a, a question in particular about business rates in terms of is, is it or should it be part of the long-term solution for local government finance. Whatever the, the issues around the flaws in each of those two taxes, they generate about 50 billion pounds a year of income for local public services. So council tax generates 32 billion pounds a year. The local share of business rates held by councils is about 17 billion. That's about half of the 100 billion pound total spend on local government services. The other half coming from grants, mainly from education for schools, police, public health and others. So uh, if there is to be reform or replacement of, of the current local taxes, we need to find an alternative way of raising 50 billion pounds if they are to be changed or significantly uh, uh, reduced. We also, in doing that, need to think about the important democratic link between taxation and representation. We often talk about there should be no taxation without representation, but we need to ensure we, we avoid the situation where we have representation and influence on what goes on without people paying any tax towards it. So moving on then to the next slide, which is about health and social care. Uh, and I know James and Anita are gonna cover this in more detail, but SIPFA's submission uh, talked about the need for a longer term funding for social care, some clarity on public health funding, uh, the need for multi-year capital settlements for the NHS, some suggestions about the NHS financial framework, and also some thoughts about the sort of uh, extending systems working through the integrated care systems and sustainability and transformation partnerships that exist uh, across the health and care economy. Uh, in terms of the NHS financial framework, some of you will be aware that during COVID, we moved towards a block grant funding system rather than the normal payment by results, payment by activity mechanisms. Uh, and I saw something this morning on on Twitter, I think from the Health Service Journal, which talked about the NHS potentially thinking about this being a solution beyond COVID into the, into the medium term. Uh, I think that'll be welcome. James or uh, Anita might say a bit more about, about that. And also as well, I think the, the need to strengthen whole systems working around the formation of STPs and ICSs, which don't currently sit on a statutory footing. The NHS England have recommended they could be part uh, or in an NHS bill of the system by default and certainly sit for support moves towards integrated working that improve health and well-being for the populations that we that we jointly serve. The next slide then, uh, uh, I'm not sure how many delegates we have from the NHS but just a few words about NHS capital. Despite the relatively healthy and generous financial settlements for NHS revenue, capital budgets have been reducing in real terms and are much lower than comparable investments internationally. Uh, health infrastructure plans, which were announced last year, committed a five-year rolling program of investment in NHS infrastructure, mainly in the acute sector, but without funding certainty around, around that. And that doesn't make prudent or sustainable financial management easy. The NHS capital system is a complex system in need of reform. Indeed, it's possibly the only or one of the very few financial advantages that local authorities have over the NHS. Now, there aren't many would die for the money, but actually the ability to use potential borrowing to borrow for capital investment without relying on central government capital allocations is an important freedom that local government have. And maybe that could be something that we could think about with our NHS partners. Next slide then, uh, say a few words about uh, about social care. And I know James is going to talk about this in much more in much more detail, but I think the challenges of funding adult social care, I think, are, are, are well known. A growing ageing population, living longer in ill health, people surviving longer with chronic conditions, complex disabilities and comorbidities. I think all good things for society, but, but they, come at a, uh, they come at a cost which is currently not properly funded. Covid has obviously highlighted the weaknesses in the social care sector's resilience, particularly around what happened in residential care settings. 
but hopefully COVID might be the catalyst for finally getting social care funding on a sustainable basis. And some of those challenges uh, are about you know, individuals fearing catastrophic care costs, you know, the, the fact that people might have to, have to sell their homes to fund the cost of their dementia care, but not having to do the same if they have cancer, for example. And that appears to be the most popular and populist dimension to the social care funding uh, question. But actually, it's not just about that. The general increase in demand for services arising from demographic pressures at which public funding has not kept pace. The fact that we aren't making long-term preventive investments. The fact that the provider market is fragile uh, and in some parts of the country unsustainable. And maybe even a question about, is the market the right way to deal with the challenges that we face? Uh, there's, a, there's certainly much more of a question about that now than there has been in recent times where sort of private and voluntary provision has increasingly become uh, a really important part of, of, of social care provision. Uh, and whilst SITFA makes no uh, recommendations uh, about how to do this, it does put forward a, on the next slide, uh, uh, a five point plan to guide, uh, to guide reform. I think there's a critical need to improve the long term sustainability of the system. I think that's unarguable. Uh, I guess you can do that two ways. You can put more money into the system or you can change the service expectations or standards. Uh, that, in essence, becomes a political or economic choice. Uh, but doing nothing, I think, is unsustainable. And while SITFA makes no recommendations at this stage about what is the right level of funding, nor a specific proposal about what's the right split of the share of care costs between state or publicly funded and individual contributions, we do propose a five point plan to guide the development towards a sustainable system. Uh, and that includes social care being as part of a mechanism looking at the, the whole of the health and social care system, not just adult social care for elderly people in its own right. It also looks at social care support from a zero based perspective as part of broader and wider uh, welfare and support programs. So alongside pensions, alongside acute care, alongside welfare, it's part of a whole system. Uh, Preventive investments need to be encouraged or enabled to maximise the long-term sustainability and value for money. And there are ways and ways of doing that in terms of direct funding, some incentives, or for example, on reporting requirements. And should we, could we, for example, require NHS authorities to specify in public uh, how much they are spending of their total budgets on prevention? It's much lower in the UK than it is in many other countries. The system needs to also ensure fairness within and between generations and to protect individuals from some of the catastrophic care costs by pooling risks. And finally, again, a political economic debate, philosophical debate about the sharpness of the differential between social care as a largely paid for service and health as an essentially free at point of use service. You know, uh, we need to be clear as a country, as a society, what is the right the right, the right model there. Finally then, just some words about public health prevention and place. There's clear evidence that the value of spending through public health grant uh, is effective. And a recent survey suggested it's up to four times as effective, cost effective as some aspects of NHS spending. The government's 2019 consultation on prevention emphasized the importance of place as being integral to the implementation of preventative strategies. Prevention investment can reduce demand, it can avoid future costs, it can improve financial sustainability, and it can improve outcomes. There's no evidence that it saves any money. You cannot save money out of your current budgets from preventative investments, but you can improve outcomes and avoid future costs and reduce future, future demand. Uh, we need to think about it as an investment in its own right for better outcomes and not as a way of saving money because there's no evidence that it, that it saves any money but it's a good thing to do to improve outcomes and avoid future costs and generate future sustainability. And finally, the wider determinants of health and well-being aren't just about NHS and social care interventions. It's not about illness and care. It's about health and well-being in a broader sense. And it's a really fundamental role for local community assets, local knowledge and local political leadership to play a role in leading the way towards a sustainable system for health and well-being in the round. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there.
uh, I know James and uh, Lisa are going to say some more about th those last two bits in particular, and I look forward to your questions in the in the Q and A and discussion later. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a really good sort of scene setter and obviously a nice uh, encapsulation of, of Sitfa's position. Um, before I move on to introduce um, our second speaker, who is James Bullion, I just want to remind everyone to please keep uh, sending your questions in. I've already had a couple in, which is great. Um, um, we um, will get to those at the end of the session. Um, OK, so our second speaker is James Bullion. Um, James is the current president of the Association of Directors of Adult. Social Services, better known as uh, ADAS probably to most of you. Um, he is also uh, Executive Director for Adult Social Services at Norfolk and he leads um, the development of primary and community care for the Norfolk and Waveney Sustainability and Transformation Partnership. Prior to joining Norfolk County Council, James worked at Essex County Council where he was Director of Adult Operations and the Director of Adult Social Services. James, please go ahead. Hello, do we have James? Ah, I'm muted. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, there's a bit of delay Hello. there. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you, um, I'll, I'll mute myself now and I'll let, you, I'll let you carry on with your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and um, uh, great to be here and really interesting to hear from uh, Andy, the SIPFA uh, perspective, which has a great deal in, in common uh, actually with, with uh, ADAS. So um, hopefully I'm controlling my uh, slides here. So I'm uh, James Bullion, the president of ADAS and um, I'm going to see if I can move my slides on. Yeah, so ADAS, uh, we, we are the um, essentially the uh, rep representatives of 152 directors around uh, England and uh, one of us is elected each, each year to uh, represent the rest of us. And um, I, I, you'll find a lot in common with what I'm saying, what Andy's just said, actually. So I don't, I don't apologize for reiterating some of these, but I'll, co I'll go quite uh, quickly through them. So we, we've had um, a history the past five years or so uh, of short-term time-limited funding uh, settlements. Um, welcome as they have been individually, but um, the, the aggregation of that has, has painted us into a strategic corner, as it were, where we're now um, uh, had initiative after initiative piled on top of one another, and we now need a strategic look at that. Um, as Andy said, we've got very fragile care markets. Um, we, we've got, when this is a positive, increasing demographic pressure from both an ageing society um, many years of which uh, produce uh, healthy lives, but some some of which are unhealthy and uh, obviously require social care as well as health services. But we celebrate that, and um, in, uh, and lesser understood perhaps and lesser known um, these days. As a director of adult social services, half your budget is around older people, but the other half is around a relatively few number of adults with uh, complex disabilities, learning disabilities, physical disabilities, mental health problems, autism, um, which increasingly is growing as a demographic and uh, an inflationary cost. Um, we've seen increasing levels of unmet need and undermet need. Um, some really good reports from, for example, Age UK, which shows to some degree um, around one and a half million people at least who are uh, I've got a need that isn't being met by the state because of the rules uh, and uh, that level of unmet need is growing and has a consequence for councils and for the NHS. And then as Andy's really showed very clearly, and we call for this in unison with SIPFA, a, a lack of resources um, for intervention around prevention. And we look with envy at the NHS 10 year plan, which has inbuilt into it um, excellent prevention initiatives like population health management or ageing well programs or primary care uh, programs. And then finally, uh, we, we have a significant problem and, and uh, opportunity of the social care workforce, which has a vacancy factor of about seven or eight percent at the moment, there's like 100 
thousand jobs and also um, has a turnover rate of about 35 percent in general 40 percent in home care 50 percent in social care nursing so it's a real you know real challenges um, of logistics and quality as a result uh, of of that um, and I'm hoping the slide's going to change um, so as well as that um, you know this is how it feels uh i'm not suggesting that uh you know we we uh we are victims as it were and and social care spends about 19 20 billions so what we do with the money we have is really important and how we work and people's rights and so on but actually the system is going to sink as a whole unless unless we do something uh, about the about the current uh, situation uh, that we find ourselves in um, so th this is the national picture, uh, Andy's covered this, we've got a one year review, we're, we're waiting for uh, the settlement and uh, we're likely to get uh, budgets uh, known about quite late. The, the, the issue for us uh, around that is that um, for councils, it means we have to now assume that next year uh, we've got the money that we've got and uh, we need to start consulting on further reductions in social care budgets. So we've ended up with a position here in. A, in our annual survey in ADAS, where uh, directors are saying, you know, most directors are saying they've got either no confidence or only partial confidence that their budgets will be sufficient to meet their uh, statutory uh, duties. Which, if you think about it, is an extraordinary thing for directors to be saying, here we are in statutory DAS roles um, with the law requiring us to meet need, and most of us don't think that we can do that. Uh, for next year. So uh, something has to give uh, in the current uh, circumstance. Um, what, what we already know is we've got uh, an existing commitment of a billion pounds a year over the lifetime of the Parliament. We in ADAS are assuming that even though this is a one-year settlement, that multi-year commitment uh, will continue. And we're less confident, but we would suggest perhaps that the adult social care precept highly problematic as a mechanism for funding but nonetheless we think it's likely that that will continue the uh, secretary of state almost said it would at the uh, at recent health and social care uh, committee meeting but um, certainly indicated that that might be an assumption so we many councils will be assuming that that precept will will continue and will find themselves uh, in a, a a shocking position if it doesn't um, in, in terms of what um, ADAS has said, we, we've called, even though we know it's a one-year settlement, we've been consistent in calling for a two-year funding commitment. I suppose we take the view, and we published nine statements of reform in uh, June of this year, we take the view that we've got a couple of years where we need to bring stability to the system. We've got an immediate problem of COVID, which we applaud the government for responding to with funding, one-off funding. But then beyond that, we've got a, a two year period of stability before any kind of reform would kick in. And therefore, we call for a two year funding commitment, even though we've got a one year uh, settlement. Um, we need an indication of what the future uh, looks like. We've also asked for the full funding of the COVID pressures in this year, which will bounce into next year. And typically speaking, councils are now beginning to predict up and down uh, England that their costs are likely to be inflated by around 10% next year as a result of uh, the disruption of this year. And so the one-off cost of this year will impact our ability both to uh, make efficiencies and transform next year, but the actual costs of care next year will be higher. Um, we, we've suggested that there's a £1.2 billion gap for demography and inflation, and we are calling for um, uh, action to try and deal with the workforce uh, problem that we perceive. Um, we think part of the answer lies in better pay and conditions for the workforce. That's not the whole of the answer, but certainly um, we don't take the view in ADAS, uh, and we urge government and Treasury not to take the view that somehow the vacancies in social care will be uh, filled by a recession. Uh, it didn't happen before in, in the last recession, it will not happen again. We, we feel that the wages, uh, uh, 
we need an intervention around wage levels. We, we, we know perhaps for the government that might not be likely, it's quite an interventionist thing to do, but in our view, unless we assist at an industry level, we, we feel the workforce problems will continue. We've suggested pegging pay to uh, band three of uh, a, a nursing assistant, a healthcare assistant, that's about £10.90 an hour. That costs about £2 billion at today's uh, prices. Um, and then uh, finally, we feel uh, the need to call for uh, capital so that we can invest in significant change and transformation around digital and around housing in, in particular. So that's the asks of um, ADAS uh, in terms of the spending uh, review. Um, if it's just a rollover of existing monies, then the cliff edge for next year means that councils will go back to reducing their budgets by about 10 to 15 percent uh, at a time actually when probably needs have expanded as a result of COVID and other factors and prices have increased because of the disruption in, in the market. So what looks like you know, a standstill will actually take us back considerably. Um, the, the other ADAS uh, perspective very strongly is, and, and Andy made this point, is that um, a general better settlement for local government means that that will be a better settlement for adults and indeed for children's services since we now make up about 38, 40% of council budgets around uh, the country. Uh, and I think I've covered the notion of, uh, of, of increased uh, legacy costs. Um, like Andy, we think the short termism is costing us money. Um, we can't plan, we can't let long uh, arrangements with our care providers or uh, council companies, we can't need meaningfully engage with the NHS um, in pooling and joint arrangements if we don't have a long-term uh, settlement. And uh, we're very pleased to see the notion that the NHS have got into the short-term care payments uh, arrangements with the discharge to assess um, arrangements of this year. We absolutely would like those to continue next year, that commitment. And the notion of a place-based budget um, with the uh, arrangements for block uh, contracts. Many uh, ICSs and SDPs, my own included in Norfolk, have gone to that model and really we need the flexibility to create a single place budget or aspects of a single place budget uh, in an area. So we really would um, uh, celebrate that. We, we uh, perhaps anticipate that that's in the proposed legislation, uh, perhaps anticipating that the consultation on that legislation is about to start actually. So. Uh, we would really welcome um, that kind of flexibility in, in a local uh, in a local area. So um, we um, think that doing nothing is not an option. We've all increasingly now got the cost of care gap widening. So the cost that private individuals pay versus the cost that the uh, local government sector are able to pay is widening. And the business models of the care sector are dependent on that. Um, what might be perceived as an unfairness between those two uh, sectors, uh, one perhaps subsidising the other. Um, that's going to widen unless at a national level we have funding reform of uh, social care. ADAS doesn't have a formal position of what that reform should be, whether there should be a cap and a floor and an annual uh, maximum or whether care should be free. Don't have a formal position on that. Our members, because uh, we are politically um, part of political organisations, there are differing views, but we absolutely know that the key to unlocking a long-term view is to unlock that political problem. And we, we urge government to uh, find a, either a consensus or a decision uh, on that. Um, we think that we have really suffered by balancing the books over the last 10 years. It's meant that we haven't invested in prevention and we uh, haven't uh, being able, therefore, to um, widen our involvement with um, the um, uh, uh, voluntary sector and the community uh, sector. And um, that's it from me. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much, James. Um, I am now going to just move on and introduce our final speaker, who um, is uh, Anita Charlesworth, who's Director of Research and the Real Centre at the Health Foundation, Real 
stands for Research and Economic Analysis for the Long Term. Um, before joining um, before joining the Health Foundation in 2014, Anita is Chief Economist at the Nuffield Trust. Um, she's also worked in central government uh, at the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. And between 1998 and 2007, she was Director of Public Spending at the Treasury, where she led the team working with Sir Derek Wanless on his NHS funding reforms. Anita has an MSc in Health Economics from the University of York. Uh, she's a trustee for Tommy's, a baby, the baby charity, uh, and also a trustee for the of Office of Health Economics. Anita, um, over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so I, I'm going to talk about the um, spending review from a healthcare perspective, but the way I'm going to come at this is really think about coming out of COVID, what are the issues that we've got to um, address and how do we deal with those? And like others, um, this slide isn't moving for me. So could you move me to the next slide, please? Excellent. So obviously this week um, we've got some um, real optimism. <laughs> that we're moving to the next phase of recovery from the pandemic with the vaccination. What I want to do, though, is, is just share with you, I think, even if that is successfully rolled out by Eastern, as John Bell has said, the, the, the health footprint of COVID um, we will, will be with us for some time. And the NHS was, has received a five year settlement for the period 2018-19 to 23-24. There are two things about that which I think are really important for thinking about in this spending review. The first is that that settlement was for frontline services, it was for the NHS England budget and it explicitly excluded the capital budget, the spending on the workforce, the spending on prevention via the public health uh, grant. So there was already before COVID unfinished business um, for this spending review um, uh, around uh, healthcare. The second thing is that unless COVID just um, completely ends in terms of its impact on the 31st of March, that's, it is really rather important that that spending uh, settlement was obviously conceived of in a world where COVID was beyond anyone's imagination. And I find this um, schema quite useful then to think about what does government need to think about as it moves forward with COVID. So obviously we're incredibly aware at the moment of the wave one impact of COVID-19 on this graph and the immediate hit we've taken in terms of mortality and morbidity and obviously today's ONS figures showing S S deaths at um, just under a thousand in the week up to the 30th of October and excess deaths as a whole now at over 60,000 in England and Wales and it does look like we've had one of the biggest if not the biggest health impacts across Europe from wave one. <laughs> The second impact that we've focused on increasingly in the NHS is that the way we managed that first round of COVID was essentially to turn the NHS from being a full health service into a COVID service and an awful lot of care was interrupted and this is both wave two and wave three and much focus from <coughs> is now turning to um, well through the winter how do we manage COVID alongside other services so that we don't completely shut down and secondly how do we pick up the uh, delayed care that we experienced um, over the last six months we're also aware in this first wave tail that we've got not everybody who has covid bounces back we've got obviously a profile with covid that this affects older people people with existing uh, comorbidities Many of those have ended up in intensive care and coming out of that, they're very unlikely in many cases to get back fully to the levels of health and social functioning that they had prior to COVID. We're also seeing amongst younger age groups this phenomenon of long COVID, 
We don't know quite how many people that will be, how long that will be, but we do know that um, even if, if we can get the incidence of COVID down, we will have a legacy here. And then the fourth wave, which is very important, is in essence how this experience, particularly of uh, the way we've had to manage COVID and the policy response of lockdowns and contractions on our lives and economic activity will lead to long-term health effects with mental illness, economic effects, and also for the workforce, a key issue of burnout. Next slide, please. So obviously the nature of the um, effect depends hugely on how COVID-19 pans out, yeah? So people's hope, uh, I think, proved unrealistic this autumn was that we just had that um, summer peak and then progressively got back to normal. It's looking like we're more likely to be in this um, middle scenario where we've got another peak now and we'll hope to immunise <laughs> And we may have further outbreaks, but progressively through 2020-21, through 2021, um, we'll see um, less uh, COVID. Obviously, without the vaccine, we potentially uh, face that third scenario, which is extremely challenging. Next slide, please. So what we're focused on, and I think this spending review and beyond really needs to think about is how then does demand change compared to what we were expecting through uh, the remainder of this parliament next year and beyond? And two things that are quite important in this, you know, how does it change the healthcare needs that people have? And how does it affect the way that people seek healthcare from the um, NHS? And so we're looking obviously at those healthcare needs, particularly, I think, focus on the mental health issues uh, that might arise. We're concerned as well that people haven't been able to access healthcare for existing needs and um, obviously waiting times are rising significantly and there's modelling around and the NHS Confederation has been talking about waiting lists potentially increasing from 4 million pre-pandemic uh, to 10 million by the end of the parliament and those numbers are very plausible actually, if, if, if very, very large. Um, and then the other thing we're seeing is uh, changes in the way that people use services starting to come in with the aim that people won't go to A&E without first calling, with, with large amounts of GP services, to digital first, want to continue with a lot of that. There's an ambition as well with the, to transform outpatients, uh, which has also moved just significantly uh, digital first. But in all of that, we need to make sure that it works for people and key groups, particularly those most vulnerable, are not left behind by that. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> COVID, though, hasn't just changed uh, demand. It will. It's also changed already capacity in the system and cost. And what we've seen, obviously, is um, uh, large amounts of new cost, PPE, test and uh, trace, um, the need for the Nightingale centres, the discharge arrangements into social care and um, capacity in the private sector. Um, that's likely to amount to over £40 billion this year, and it won't return to nothing next year. And just pause on that. So essentially, the direct costs of COVID this year for the NHS are double the social care budget in a normal year. So this has been huge. But also what's happening, obviously, is that infection control measures are changing very significantly how we can deliver care and reducing our productivity. So um, theatre throughput, number of patients on the ward, um, even down to vaccinations, you can't have people queuing up all together to move them in and out really rapidly. Turnaround between people needs to be much uh, greater. So productivity is also down. And one of the key questions we'll have is just how quickly can we get back to normal models of delivering care? And how long will we have both the direct costs of COVID in terms of running a test and trace system, uh, the um, PPE, the need for that extra capacity, and also how long will we be running with, with low productivity because of infection control? None of that factored into the NHS settlement. Uh, next slide, please. But 
beyond that, I think the feeling very much is, is obviously the task next year is clearly to manage COVID really well because it will be with us and to resource that. And as this is, uh, episode has shown, under-resourcing that is the ultimate false economy because countries that have been harder hit with COVID seem to also have been harder hit economically. So you end up with those interventions that really slam the brakes on your uh, economic activity and then leave you with the longer legacy uh, scarring both to health and well-being and your economy. But as we uh, build, manage COVID, we also need to think about how we're going to put the NHS back on a resilient footing and recover. And we've got this need to meet future uh, to, to pick up with the waiting list and address some of those backlogs of care to address the new needs that emerge from COVID. But also, actually, we went into this with some real fault lines in our system, and particularly when you think from a World Health Organization perspective about what it is that health we, we should be trying to do in a country, which is really to improve health rather than just to run a sickness service. So we want to build back an NHS which is closer to that vision. Next slide, please. And I think although we've suffered most uh, really heavily compared to other countries from COVID, we also before this were in a difficult place in terms of our health overall. So what this slide shows you is that along the bottom, the average improvement in um, uh, age standardized mortality in the decade up to 2011 and the UK was above the um, average average was just over 2.3 we were at 2.7 percent a year so we were above average but in the period from 2011 up to 2016 we're uh, we've seen the lowest rate of improvement in mortality across uh, comparable countries so we are now below average, having been in for a period above average. And for some groups, so in particular, for example, women in, in uh, deprived areas under 50, their life expectancy was actually declining, not increasing through this uh, recent years. So it's not just COVID that we need to address. We need a, we need a system um, in, in this spending review, which really uh, addresses people's health and, and within that, a healthcare system that can meet these sorts of needs. Next slide, please. The other thing which we need to think about very clearly is capacity. So no country, I think, could have met the, the uh, COVID-19 surge um, without having to um, invest and change the way it delivered care. No one had spare capacity to that degree. But we were particularly short of capacity in ways which have made managing this a very uh, significant challenge. And I think um, we'll, we'll want to reflect on that. And I think it's very unlikely that we'll want to be in a similar position again. So we need to address that. So if we look at hospital beds, uh, scanners, which are important for cancer, MRI and CT, uh, nurses and doctors per head, we're, um, at or below um, the bottom of the league tables uh, for, for all those measures of capacity. Uh, next slide, please. And, and beds are uh, 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 really example. So, you know, everywhere has been uh, across uh, the EU has been reducing uh, beds, but uh, we've been reducing against the backlog already of having been um, pretty much the lowest in uh in europe in terms of capacity summer stevens had already said pre-covid the real questions about whether or not this could continue and whether we had overdone it um next slide please <laughs> so the agenda which i think needs to frame a one-year spending review is after this first wave what do we need to do we need to make sure that we get back a health service not just a covid19 service so dealing with those waiting times, the cancer backlog, which we're very worried about, the rising mental health. Um, we need to address the new, new health needs. We need to tackle the inequalities, which have 
being shone such a light on in COVID. And clearly we need to put social care on an equal footing with the NHS. Um, one of the most important capacity issues is the workforce. We need more staff. This is a really important moment because there's a real opportunity coming out of COVID. And we've seen with the 2020 summer intake that we've been able to increase the numbers going into nursing and um, medicine. And we need to build on that, catalyze that. And we need to make sure that health is part of the solution post-COVID, offering good work to those who are losing work elsewhere. In social care, we need a fundamentally better deal for staff and improved regulation. <clears throat> and we would argue for a national workforce plan um, as well as an NHS workforce plan. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we need to invest in data, I think. Obviously, vaccines is going to be really critical. And um, Sir John Bell said, you know, the key on uh, the key challenge uh, now is that we've got a vaccine, hopefully may have three vaccines by Christmas. Um, we need to make sure that we don't screw it up in terms of delivery uh, that. So we need good procurement, good delivery, equitable access, both here and globally. All of this will cost um, funding. Uh, we're going to need long term funding to build capacity and resilience. A lot of that will come from actually addressing the unfinished business from the NHS settlement pre-election, and that's public health, workforce and capital. We need a major injection of public money on social care, and we need um, public spending decisions going forward that really focus on the social determinants of health. I think beyond all of that, though, there are also some interesting leadership and governance issues which touched on in the previous presentations. <clears throat> the balance between national and local decision making, which I think has really struggled through this pandemic, whether we're lacking a regional tier, whether or not national is too big and local is too local. And have countries that have done better had a, a stronger regional tier? And we need to, reality, to make a reality of system thinking at the centre. So, for example, one of the most things we could have done best, perhaps with hindsight, to improve resilience would have been to have had really coherent cross government action on obesity. Um, so, we need to think differently. Uh, about all of this at the centre, locally and regionally. And uh, that next slide, please. That's the end from me. And I think it is <clears throat> really important, even with a single year spending review, that that spending review makes sure, firstly, that it is funding COVID-19, because those costs will be very substantial next year, but that actually it's, it's setting out, sowing the seeds and a framework then for the future of public spending, which is orientated actually at building back better and building back resiliently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. That was fantastic. Um, just go, we've got about 10 minutes for some uh, questions uh, for the whole panel. Um, I think my, um, I think my um, colleagues might be turning some cameras on, so you might be able to see our speakers. Um, but just to, just to kick us off, um, obviously we did need to touch on this a couple of points during her presentation. Um, but it'd be really interesting to get the whole panel's reaction to the news yesterday about the the vaccine, the fairly positive news that, that we might be, hopefully have a vaccine ready to roll out, um, you know, it, it really in the next few weeks. Um, do, you, do you want to, I mean, Anita, do you want to kick us off with just, you know, just a sort of uh, roundup of what, what, you, what, what, you've, what you think from the health point of view, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to James and Andy. Yeah, so obviously it's, it, it is fantastically um, uh, good good news, I, I think. Um, obviously, uh, it, it presents a new and really important challenge over the next uh, few months, because what we're going to have to do is in tandem is manage the current outbreak of COVID-19, which vaccine can't do much about, where it's already here and people have got it, and some of those same health services roll out a mass vaccination program as fast as they possibly can and with this vaccine it's quite a challenging one largely because of the storage issue where it's got to be stored at i don't I remember whether it's minus 70 or minus 80 i mean it's so bloody cold that <laughs> you can't quite get your head around it um so you know and also at the same time obviously really think through just what does this vaccine uh, do for us because I mean, so we know obviously that it looks like it's very efficacious, but an individual level, 
but quite what it means for the path back to normality, we're, we're not uh, fully uh, sure about. And I think keeping population with us to understand that it won't mean that it, a light is, is switched um, overnight and we just go back to how we were in January 2020. James, do you want to come in on, with some thoughts about the vaccination programme? I think uh, well, social not, care is at uh, the top of the list, isn't it? <laughs> For receiving it um, well we, we are heartening to hear i mean it's it's great uh, it's great and optimistic news um I, I don't think it should make us too optimistic too soon though until we actually start the the process of of rolling out um it, it was good to hear in the media coverage that social care in particular care homes and vulnerable people would be uh, up there on the list uh, uh you know in first order um I suppose I'm worried that that might create a culture of a slight complacency in communities because the evidence is that for vulnerable people, outbreaks come from community uh, and jump to vulnerable and older people. And I'm, I suppose I'm a bit of an Eeyore as well in relation to the, the whole testing uh, and tracing arrangements. I think local government have got a lot more to do with the NHS to get those right and they, that will be just as effective uh, in the short term as any as any logistics around a vaccine but absolutely welcome it as one of 11 potential solutions it's really it was really great to hear and Andy do you have any thoughts to add yeah so, so forgive the accountant in me but I guess struck by Anita's brilliant slide about the health footprint of the pandemic and particularly the stuff about stuff that will last longer the other side of the vaccine uh, so the Chancellor's put in £400 billion to support the economy. Anita's talked about £40 billion worth of one-off costs for the NHS, which is double the annual social care spend. For a relatively small amount of money in the context of very big numbers, we could put local public services on a sustainable footing to contribute to levelling up in the way we've contributed to the response. So local government spends £100 billion a year. So. Uh, that's going to not be, it can't be 100 the other side of COVID, but actually for 110 or 120, just 10 or 20 billion pounds more in total, of which social care could take a big chunk, we could put local public services at the heart of levelling up in the recovery. We, 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 so, we, so it's easy to talk about big numbers in the context of even bigger numbers, but I think hopefully we should be arguing for a relatively small investment can make a really big local impact. Thank you. Um, we've had a question actually directed at James, but um, I think it'd be good to have everybody's thoughts. Um, sadly, there's been a lot of deaths this year. Um, but won't that reduce pressure on adult social care to an extent going forward? Uh, well, there, there have been um, excess deaths as well as uh, as well as expected uh, deaths around uh, COVID and its uh, impact. I mean, it, 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 I think it's too early to say what the overall picture is, actually. Uh, and, and of course, we can't think in those terms. Those, you know, the first starting thought is what, what an awful experience for those individuals and their families. And the costs are wider than the, as it were, demand management impact of, of, um, of someone having died uh, in receipt of either a health or, or a social uh, care service, firstly. And then secondly, I think you've got um, the, the, the impact of COVID more generally on people's uh, uh, health and, and on their well-being uh, has increased costs. So you, I, I think we're not, you know, we don't have the complete picture, but it's, it's not going to be as simple as, um, you know, the, 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 the sad and brutal um, statistic that, that someone's imagining there. Do you have any thoughts, Anita? Could I, I add, add to that? Because um, I, one of the things I mentioned is, is the people who've had COVID, to get older people who've survived, you know, if they've been in intensive care or been, even if they've not had mechanical ventilation, oxygen support, they've been in hospital for quite some time, very poorly, on top of some uh, underlying frailty or, or chronic conditions. You know, the recovery, for, it will be, uh, unrealistic, I think, to expect that most of those people will get back to the sort of activities of daily living that they were doing before, um, beforehand. So we can expect, I think, some quite a lot of need coming through the system. We've also had a lot of people, older people, who've been living on their own, the shielding group, who've lost contact with the outside, 
uh, world and, and um, will have lost some of their confidence and ability to, to manage on their own. And, and I think one of the things we need to think about and be prepared for is coming out of this a wave of new unmet need that we'll need to uh, address. But the challenge against that, I think, is then will people want a very different sort of social care provision because of the legacy of this experience? So we know that a lot of care homes occupancy rates are down at the moment. You know, will families and individuals be very reluctant to go into care homes? So will we see a further shift? To care at home and will that be an, a, a different uh, profile and how do we adjust to that and what do we do then about the viability of care home providers who you know are still providing a really important service to a proportion of people but on a lower occupancy rate so this is all going to be really quite complex i think to work through and we don't quite and we can't know um what is a transition yeah and a temporary phenomenon and what out of COVID is one of those structural changes that comes that you don't never get back to where you were before. Okay. So, Andy, so, do you want to so follow just up? To add brief, yeah, just briefly. So I think James mentioned there are about a one and a half million people have got unmet or undermet need. We're talking about maybe excess deaths all courses, 60,000 people. Uh, so there might be a short term saving against people's care budgets, but actually that, un, that undermet and unmet need is only going to be higher as a consequence of what's happened with COVID. I can't recall the number of people who receive social care services nationally. Three million or so would be my best guess. James will know the precise figure. But actually, so 60,000 excess deaths compared with three million people, uh, it's, it's going to make a short term dent, uh, but not have a, 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 a meaningful financial impact. Sadly, talking about numbers. <laughs> We're, we're on, we are on three o'clock, so I just I, perhaps we can squeeze one more quick question in as it's just, just with quite brief responses. So the government's um, ditched the idea of a, of a social care green paper, I think, and it's going to go straight to a white paper. Do you, are we ever going to see the, the light at the uh, white paper, do you think, or will it be a casualty of Brexit or, and or COVID? Thoughts on that? Shall I start? Yeah, I please think, do. Um, I, I definitely think we're going to see uh, a proposal around funding reform. Uh, so that, that's the first thing. And, I, and you can see evidence of thought about that going on. Um, and I also think the minister was really straight up at our NCAS conference last week saying that she did not want to be known as the COVID uh, minister. She wants to do social care reform. So I think we will, but I think it will be more limited than perhaps, um, or more staged over a number of years than perhaps we might have anticipated pre-COVID. Anita, you're nodding. Would you, would you agree with that yeah, assessment? I do. I think the fear is it becomes a narrow focus on catastrophic costs of care and it misses the wider needs, which really, really are fundamental to the sort of future we want to have and a society we want to live in, in terms of looking after those who are, you know, most frail and most in need of support from their communities. Uh, that's my fear. It ends up being just about avoiding catastrophic care costs. Okay. On that note, I'm going to bring the webinar to a close. Um, I'd like to thank um, our three speakers, Andy Burns, James Bullion and Anita Charlesworth um, for, for their time. Um, for join and to all the audience, we've had um, over 100 people with us today, so that's been great to see. Um, and uh, we'll be making a recording of this webinar available on the sit for youtube channel in the next day or two. Um, so if you did miss any of the uh, presentation or you want to share it with a colleague, uh, you'll be able to do so uh, via YouTube. Um, thank you again for joining us. <laughs>